The Herd, wherever you may be and however you may be listening, live in Los Angeles, iHeartRadio, Fox Sports Radio, and FS1. Christine Leahy is joining me on a robust and dynamic Thursday. Why is it robust? Oh, that there, sounds like a soup. It is robust and dynamic with broth. We've got all sorts of things today. I, I want to start with this. Um, I'm an opinion guy. Uh, I don't have access to a lot of locker rooms. I could, but it's not what I do anymore. So I am an opinion guy. I don't consider myself some grand journalist. I do understand journalism. I do understand there are certain principles, get things double sourced. But um, I tend to lean on people who have a history, not a 22-year-old blogger. Give me a 50-year-old NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball guy that's been doing it a long time, that has built up an archive of sources. And yesterday, Chris Sheraton has been doing this a long, long time, covering the NBA since the Peter Vesey days, that kind of thing. David Aldridge, NBA sources said today, quote, this will be LeBron's final season in Cleveland. He is 100% leaving relationship with owners beyond repair. Okay, let's think about that. Who is Chris Sheraton? The same guy that was way ahead of the crowd three years ago reporting LeBron would likely leave the heat for the Cavs, which obviously happened. There's a precedent. There's a history. He's been right before on LeBron. Translation. He's got good sources on LeBron. But let's not talk Chris Sherritt and let's talk LeBron. Did you notice that LeBron did not tweet yesterday that Chris Sheraton was wrong? And LeBron was all over. I checked on Twitter yesterday. Foundation, charity, wife, friends, hoops. No denial. Well, Colin, I mean, come on. He was busy. LeBron immediately denied the Stephen A. Smith story that LeBron wanted to kick Kyrie Irving's butt, immediate denial. Remember when that story came out? LeBron eager to trade Kyrie. Immediate denial. Remember when the former general manager, David Griffin, was being let go? Immediate tweet in support of David Griffin. When David Blatt was fired, an immediate, I had nothing to do with it. Chris Sheraton, he's gone. It's over. Crickets. There's a follow-up tweet by Chris Sheraton, NBA reporter. One follow-up tweet on LeBron leaving. Denials from his reps are disingenuous. They will slash must lie to protect his image. Look up the word disingenuous. Hypocrites. Translation, he got it from people close to LeBron. What have I said about LeBron? He is in stage three of his career, i.e. the mogul stage, where brand protection now trumps winning basketball games. Brand protection for Spielberg, Jay-Z, Michael Jordan, LeBron, Kobe, when they get to stage three of stardom. Uh, First, it's look at me. Second, it's platinum records. Third, It's the mogul stage. What are you saying, Colin? By LeBron not denying it in the first 24 hours, he is softening the blow for when, not if, he leaves. Don't you think it's interesting, too, that when LeBron left Cleveland initially, it never got out? When LeBron left Miami before the letter, it never got out. Yet a year ahead of time, This is getting out. It's getting out because somebody is okay with it being out. Hmm. You laughed at LeBronzo. You laughed. Business here. Judd Apatow, Ron Howard, Brentwood Mansion. LeBronzo coming to the Staples Center nearest you you know i'm right on this you know i am just put that up show the audience that this is happening okay i want to shift gears 
to Mayweather McGregor. That looks ridiculous, by the way. <laughs> Kevin Ioli covers boxing and now UFC. He's a very good writer. We bring him on this show. Column in his newspaper, why the Nevada Athletic Commission was wrong to approve lighter gloves. Yes, they did. Instead of 10-ounce, they're using 8-ounce gloves. Kevin Ioli writes, a very legitimate reporter, the Nevada Athletic Commission might as well be a for-profit business and not a state regulatory body, given the message it sent yesterday when it approved a request for Floyd and Connor to wear smaller gloves. You know he's right. He also said the commission often pays lip service to its duty to protect the health and safety of the fighters. You know he's right. He continues, the regulations were put in place for a reason, and this ruling simply creates liability should a tragedy occur. Once again, Kevin Ioli is right. And he finishes by saying the commission was going to do whatever it took to get this bout done. That's the bottom line. And he's right again. Yet I am not bothered by any of it. Boxing began with no gloves and unlimited rounds. Then they shifted to gloves and limited rounds. Was a study ever done to change those moves? Nope. Then they were 12 rounds and it was reduced to 10. Did a doctor or a study determine that 12 rounds equaled instant death? 10 rounds is living well into your 90s. No study done. By the way, 10-ounce gloves are used at 154 pounds in boxing in Nevada. At 147, you can use 8-ounce gloves. Was a study done on that? No. My point is boxing has been making it up on their own forever. Can you imagine NASCAR saying the speed limit is now at 184 miles an hour? 188. You're in peril. 184, it is smooth sailing. You can drive to the grocery store at that speed. That's what this sounds like to me. The gloves now are the issue. Now think about this. The gloves now are the issue. The Nevada Athletic Commission okay to fight between the world's best pound-for-pound fighter and a man who's never boxed. And I'm worried about something the weight of a slice of bread. This is like complaining that the mob is upcharging on garbage pickup as they whack seven guys down the block on the pier. This is calling up the Nevada Athletic Commission and saying, I just saw a bunch of mob guys take out baseball bats and whack people over the head, may have killed them and drive off. And the Nevada Athletic Commission saying, you know, that's fine. But what really bothers us is the mob guys weren't wearing seat belts. They sanctioned this fight between the world's best fighter and a guy who hasn't boxed. The gloves thing is a slice of bread. Even when the gloves, wear them here, not wear them there, 12 to 10 rounds, studies done on any of this stuff. The people who get hurt in boxing know they're boxing. This has been a sport with very little unification, commission to commission, state to state, weight class to weight class. Once you sanction this fight, it was a circus. And both adult participants signed off on the circus. All right, good stuff today. Um, Chris Broussard, have not seen him in a long time, is going to address the Chris Sheraton tweet. Uh, Floyd Mayweather Sr. will stop by. I have never spoken with him. I think his son will win the fight, win every round, and rarely get hit. Uh, Seth Joyner in studio as well today here in Los Angeles. It is, um, I, I did see something yesterday. Uh, Jay Glazer was at these NFL camps and he was at really interesting camps. He was at the Carolina camp. He was at the Jay Cutler Miami Dolphin camp. He was at the Patriot camp and he interviewed Brady yesterday. And there was a, a really interesting comment between Jay Glazer and Tom. And, uh, and I want you to look at Tom's appearance by the way, cause that's something too. And that's coming up next. Welcome back. It is great to have you in on a Thursday. I'm, I have all sorts of energy on today's show, Christine. 
I don't know what it is. I just feel like I'm energized by today's show. By, by the show or something you had for breakfast? <laughs> Well, I have tomorrow off, you know, and I take some Fridays oh, off. Oh, yeah. Who I'll... am I doing the show with tomorrow? I don't know. That's a good question. Doug Gottlieb. And kind of on your own. I'll do the show. <laughs> Go for it. That'd okay. be great. Um, uh, Gottlieb next hour, by the way. Um, so one of the advantages of youth, of being young, is energy. I remember when I was young. Man, you can go out and party. I can remember when I was young and I'd play basketball, pick up basketball. I could sprain an ankle. And the next day I could play hoops. I could drink next day, get up six in the morning, play basketball. It doesn't work that way when you hit the 40s, 50s, 60s. You can still play basketball, but the world changes. That's the advantage of youth. That's the great thing about being young, man. You bounce back fast. Your body just bounces back fast. It doesn't matter how well you take care of yourself. Your body bounces back at 24 better than 44 and then better at 64. So uh, the advantage of being Older, I'm not going to say old, is wisdom that you can build up an archive of knowledge and rely on it in crisis. Tom Brady yesterday talked to Jay Glazer. Glazer's going around the country in this bus. It's really cool. He was on our show yesterday, all sorts of good information. And Brady talked to Jay about aging and when he's going to leave. I feel like I've worked hard to get to this point. So going into my 18th year, I've learned a lot. You know, I've learned, I've had the experiences, played the defense, played in the big games. And I still feel like I physically I can perform at a really high level. So I think now this is the time to really start having fun. I mean, every time I go on the field, I like, I, you know, I feel like, all right, well, I know what to do. I know how to do it. I know where to go with the ball. And, you know, football is in some ways easier now for me than it ever was because, you know, it's just I've been doing it longer. I've had the experience and, you know, hopefully that experience can pay off. For every veteran lawyer in a courtroom, for every veteran teacher in a classroom crisis, for Sully Sullenberger landing on the Hudson, the instincts, you can't teach it. I don't care if you went to Harvard. I don't care if you went to Yale. I don't care if you went to USC football. Tom Brady has thrown 9,600 NFL passes. Marcus Mariota has thrown 800. Round that up. 10,000 to 800. Tom's seen every scheme, every blitz, every stunt, every coverage, every trick, every scenario. Every one of them. That's the advantage. I don't care if you went to prep school. I don't care how smart you are. If you do something for 30 years, I have an archive that you can't have. This is what comedians do. You ever watch a veteran comedian? You go to a show. And they perform and they do a 45-minute bit. And the audience, you know, they've got strong stuff. And then they've got some weaker stuff. And the audience gets comedians. And I know a few of them. They always, they always have two, three, four, five jokes in their arsenal that if the crowd is dead, if they're not paying attention, if you need a big laugh, the comedian goes to it. For years and years, Jerry Seinfeld had this classic joke. It was his go-to joke that always got laughs. So they're showing me on television the detergents getting out blood stains. Is this a violent image to anybody? Blood stains? I mean, come on, you got a t-shirt with blood stains all over it. Maybe laundry isn't your biggest problem right now. That was his go-to. That was his go-to. I have another friend, Jeff Cesario, that's got a hysterical joke about Starbucks, uh, and it's his classic go-to. And this is what Brady has, that when people say, when you go into a game with New England, like, you are at such a pre-snap disadvantage against Tom Brady. It's not really fair. And Tom now knows it. And Tom is saying, why would I want to retire now? Good God, I'm at such an advantage over Jared Goff and Tyrod Taylor and even Andrew Luck. And for everybody that's, I understand there's advantages to youth. And there are times I'm jealous. I would love to be able to work after three hours sleep. Stay up later. Bounce back after I sprain my ankle. I'm jealous. You got me on that. But the archive you have for the veteran teacher, lawyer, quarterback, attorney, principal, landscaper, you can't duplicate it. Regardless of how good your school was, you can't duplicate it. Christine with the news. No, 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 no. Turn on the news. This is the Herdline News. 
Yesterday, I told you that the Knicks were not interested in trading for Kyrie Irving if it meant giving up Kristaps Porzingis. Yeah. Uh, today, there's a report that comes out that said that there continues to be distance between Kristaps Porzingis and the Knicks. Yeah. So they're in a bit of a tough spot yeah. and have to make a tough decision. Would you rather take the risk of having Kyrie oh, I and t- get rid of the player who doesn't really want to be there? Now, that's a really good question, Christine. I think Kyrie is slightly better than Porzingis, but I think in New York to have a star point guard from Duke that has been in the finals. If I was the Knicks, I would make the move tomorrow. Now, the question is, what's Cleveland going to do? Well, Cleveland's in a situation where Kyrie doesn't want to be there. Pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered. If, If Porzingis is available, player for player, that may be as good as you can do. Now, I think Kyrie in New York would be a superstar. I don't think he'd lead him to anything, but I think if you want a little more attention and a little... Oh, I think Kyrie in New York would be amazing for the NBA. I agree. I just don't see Kyrie ever staying there because if you look at the reasons why he's leaving Cleveland, it's because it's not a well-run organization. And so he's looking for some stability and New York does not offer that. Okay. How about if I say this? If I was Cleveland, I'd make this deal in a second. If I'm New York, haven't they been a short-term operation? Yeah, so maybe I I would do that. And I'm a firm believer that if a player doesn't want to be somewhere, you've got to get rid of him because he's not going to give you his all. And then you just have a lot of turmoil within the organization, the roster. Yeah. Uh, Dana White says that the Mayweather-McGregor fight is on track to be the biggest pay-per-view ever. Uh, His 2016 fight, Mayweather's fight with Pacquiao, set a world record 4.6 million in pay-per-view buys. So it makes sense that this would... um, go past that for two reasons. One, because at the ticket prices right now, no one's watching that in person. There's still so many seats available, so you've got to watch it on TV. And two, because you have UFC fans and boxing fans both paying to watch this. It's not just one fan group. Right. You know you know what's happening with this, Christine? And you know I think Floyd's going to win every round. He's going to win the fight. And McGregor's rarely going to touch him. But I will say this. Over the last week, when you release those videos, it does something to my small brain that I am at least now, and I, and I thought about this driving in this morning when I have my 20 minutes to kind of ruminate and figure stuff out. There is part of me that's heard so many people talk on this. I am thinking to myself, it may be more interesting than I think. Like McGregor's going to go all in, chase him around, swing for the fences, yeah. And that's all it takes, Christine. This doesn't have to be a great fight. If people like me think we're going to get a knockout either way, that's what I'll pay for. Except for that Floyd really isn't a knockout kind of guy. I know. But what if he gets crowded and he has to hit? What if McGregor gets but right also, in his grill? I, I also think we have to take into consideration that Connor is used to getting hit. He's used to getting pounded. And is he willing can take, to. He can take a punch. That, see, that's my point. Connor knows he can take the punch. Connor's going to go right up to him, bang, bang, bang. And Floyd's going to have to hit back, and we're going to have a brawl. I, I hope so. So do I. Uh, I also think that Floyd is a businessman, and he knows that he's got to let this thing go for some rounds. Otherwise, people are going to be very disappointed. And finally, Bill Belichick gave us a great soundbite yesterday. He, he was asked, uh, they're practicing currently with the Texans, so he was asked about his long standing relationship with Romeo Crennel and pay attention to his answer. You know, Romeo and I started together at the Giants um, in special teams, so uh, he and I coached special teams together and then. We coached um, defensively uh, together uh, through uh, 1990, Um, worked at the Patriots together, um, then another team, and then, you know, back with the Patriots uh, in 2001. Did you notice what team he left out? What? The Jets. He literally wouldn't mention (laughs) the Jets. Which tells me a couple things about Bill Belichick. He is very calculated in his answers. We might think he's just trying to give us nothing. Yes. But he actually gave us something there. Um, And he's also kind of still sore about that situation. Yes. Listen, anytime people say they don't listen and make a point of telling you they don't listen, they listen. Exactly. Well, no, I think sometimes that's true. I've talked to a lot of basketball players who say, listen, I really do not watch TV. 
Um, I don't watch debate shows. I don't watch sports talk. They hear about it. They hear about it because their friends tell them about it. <laughs> then they go to YouTube and watch our clips. No, they not all of them do. Some do. Hi, Russell. I know you're watching. He's Hello, not. Russell Westbrook. I, I promise you. I not. swear to God, right now he's watching. Hi. Definitely not, but he's going to hear about this. <laughs> Christine with the news. Well, that's the news. And thanks for stopping by. The Herd Line News. Okay, Chris Sheraton's a longtime NBA guy. He uh, insinuated years ago LeBron was going to leave Miami before it happened. Remember, he was on that. Let's bring in my guy via the Coward Global Satellite Network, Chris Broussard. Fox Sports Radio, our NBA guru, Chris Broussard, joining us. Okay, first of all, let's start with uh, let's just start with the source, Chris Sheraton. He's been around a long time. So is Chris Broussard, David Aldridge, a lot of you guys. Peter Vesey's now getting back into it. There's a lot of you guys been around forever. Chris Sheraton, when I when he says something, I'm like, okay, he's not a ni- he's not a 19 year old blogger. So I kind of look at it and I think, well, he's got he's, he's accumulated sources, Chris. I mean, why is Chris Sheraton? What what do you make of that? Chris has been around the league as long as anybody. You said it. Um, but I don't believe he talks to uh, LeBron's inner circle. Um, and at this point, uh, anyone who would know whether or not LeBron is definitely leaving the Cavaliers would be a member of his inner circle. I talked to a few of them, those guys yesterday, and they emphatically denied uh, the report. Uh, they emphatically denied that they've you know, talked to Chris Sheridan about it. And really, they said, look, LeBron doesn't know what he's going to do at this point. It is true. He is not about to commit to Cleveland long term, whether it's today or whether it's any time before the end of this season. He's not going to commit. That doesn't mean, though, that he is leaving there. This has been LeBron's M.O. since he went back to Cleveland. He's won maybe one plus one type deals to kind of keep his options open. Uh, So, look. They are swearing to me that LeBron has made no decision, that this report is completely false, and that he's not going to make a decision. And they said, unless you hear it from Savannah directly or somebody like that, you can't believe it. And I have to take their word for it. All right. Let, let's get to the Kyrie uh, LeBron. There was a story the other day from a local guy that they had a meeting and it wasn't fisticuffs. They sat down and talked. Just, just give me, please, give me some. You have good in, intel on this. Get, let's take Kyrie's side. Why does he want out? Was a deal ever closed somewhere else? Lay it out for our audience. There are a few things. One, I have been told that they did, they have not met LeBron and Kyrie. So it's possible they were in a room together. Maybe it was a big room, a huge room, a huge event going on. I don't know. But I'm told they did not meet. Uh, they have not spoken and met yet. Now, as far as Kyrie's reasonings for wanting to be gone, one, there is the – LeBron just looms large over that franchise, and a lot of people there are on pins and needles, yeah. and they're completely drinking the LeBron Kool-Aid. That's not Kyrie's style, and that rubs him a little bit the wrong way. Secondly, Kyrie wants to run a team as a point guard. It's not just this, it's not just about him wanting to be the man, okay? Certainly he wants to get his, his credit, and he feels like he hasn't gotten his due credit in Cleveland. He feels like people are saying, oh, LeBron just took you to the championship and all that. Look at the teams he wants to go to. San Antonio. He's not going to be the man there. Kawhi's there. Uh, Minnesota, Carl Anthony Towns, Jimmy Butler, Andrew Wiggins are there. Kyrie wouldn't necessarily be the man there, but he would be the ball handler, the point guard, the guy that gets to run the offense. And even though a lot of people, including myself, wonder, is that really Kyrie's game? He definitely thinks that's his game. I'm a point guard. Finally, the final straw as to why he wanted out of Cleveland or wants out of Cleveland, I'm told that the Cavaliers had a deal done heading into the draft. This was reported by Cleveland Scene Magazine. Nobody really picked it up. I've talked to a few people. They've said it was definitely true. But what the deal was that Cleveland would send Kyrie to Phoenix, which does want Kyrie. Robert Sarver wants Kyrie Irving. They would send him to Phoenix. Phoenix would send Eric Bledsoe in the number four pick back to the Cavaliers. The Cavaliers would send the number four pick to Indiana for Paul George. So you're getting Eric Bledsoe and Paul George for Kyrie Irving. Now, that was going to happen. Dan Gilbert goes to LeBron. 
and says, look, we got this deal on the table. I'll do it if you'll commit long term to stay in Cleveland. LeBron won't commit. Now, you can read into that if you want that he would leave or he just wants to keep his options open. But he would not commit, so Dan Gilbert would not do the deal. Now, Kyrie Irving finds out about the deal, whether it was from David Griffin telling him after he left or however he found out, but he found out about the deal, and he assumed there is, and he rightly assumed, there's no way the Cavaliers are doing this if, unless LeBron gives consent. That's why he got mad with LeBron. He thought LeBron was in on it. LeBron's take was more, look, I'm not trying to trade Kyrie Irving. He's great. But that's a heck of a deal, Eric Bledsoe and Paul George. So if you do it, hey, that's a great deal. But Kyrie took it as LeBron wanted him out of there. A few days or a week later, that's when Kyrie made his trade request. So that is kind of – that was like the final straw as the Kyrie saying, I'm getting out of here. Man, that was the best two minutes in the history of your NBA takes. That was fascinating <laughs> behind-the-scenes story. And finally, okay, I, I keep calling it LeBronzo. I'm going to trademark this thing. Business, Judd Apatow, Ron Howard, Brentwood Holm. I believe all superstars from Jay-Z, Eminem, uh, all the stars, they go from look at me, they go to the title platinum record stage, and then they segue like MJ did into the mogul stage. And I do believe LeBron is segueing now into the mogul stage where he's got titles, he won't catch MJ, he's got his money, and that the Lakers take him to a new level of branding in a mogul stage give me your thoughts on the Laker thing. I mean, you, you just gave me people Kyrie's interested in. Minnesota, uh, San Antonio. Where is LeBron on the Laker interest scale? Well, your theory makes some sense. I mean, obviously, all types of things would be, uh, there would be all types of opportunities for LeBron in L.A. But remember, he's already a business mogul. He's the greatest business mogul we've seen during his playing career in NBA history. So he's already doing that from Cleveland and from Miami before that. So I don't feel like he needs to go to L.A. And I don't think he feels like he needs to go okay. to L.A. Okay. to, you know, further his business mogulism, if you will. Um, but here's my thought, Colin, and I want your take on this, too. If LeBron James goes to the Lakers, in my opinion, he better win a title. Because every it's, it's one thing for Paul George to go to the Lakers and get them to the second round, Western Conference Finals, whatever, but not deliver a title. He's Paul George. He's not on that historic level like LeBron. Every Laker who has been on LeBron James' level, or even a little below, Kobe, Shaq, Wilt Chamberlain, Jerry West, uh, Magic, Kareem, you can go, all of the guys at that level have delivered championships. If LeBron goes to the Lakers, say with Paul George, and they go out in the second round, they go out in the Western Conference Finals, they go out even in the finals, that is not enough. And I think that's a nick on his legacy. So I think that's something that LeBron has to think about. But he has to do the math. If he stays in Cleveland and gets to the next two finals and loses and th is 3-7, and 3-8, yeah. and eight, whatever it would be, or is that worse than going to the West and go out in the second round or the conference finals? He has to weigh that. Uh, I think Skip Bayless told me himself he would kill him more for staying in Cleveland and keep losing in the finals. Yeah, no, I, I'll tell you this. I would rather, if I'm going to lose to the Warriors, I would rather lose with a young, improving, young group of Lonzo and Brandon Ingram and Paul George than an old group of J.R. Smith, Kyle Korver, whoever can't defend. I, I think the Lakers is the natural play. I think it's like opening up his pizza brand business, which he did a couple years ago. It may take a while, but it's exciting. It's It has a Silicon Valley feel to it. If you're going to lose... Lose with youth, energy, experimentation, and fun. Staying in Cleveland and losing is just awful. It's repetitive, it's old, and it's boring. And that LeBron's not boring. So there's my take. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. If, if LeBron James, it, it, I think this goes along with your theory. If he's thinking, okay, I'm about to leave my prime. I'm ready to hand over the team to somebody and just maybe he still is a great, the best player in the world. But I, I, if I'm the Lakers, and look, you take LeBron James if you can get him, no questions asked. 
But I want the ball in Lonzo Ball's hands. I don't want LeBron bringing it up 60% of the time if, I'm, if I have Lonzo Ball and I'm the Lakers, assuming he's what we saw in Summer League. And so I think if LeBron is saying, I'll go play with Lonzo Ball, and you know what? I'm going to be a scorer. I'm going to average 30 points and nine rebounds. I'm not going to be a point guard half the time. I'm not going to take the ball out of Lonzo's hands. Then I love that, that connection. But if he's going to go there and handle the ball like he does in Cleveland and Lonzo's going to play off the ball half the time when he can't really shoot, I, you know, I don't know that that helps their growth going forward unless they're able to win a championship. Yeah, stop, if, if they can win a championship with LeBron handling the ball and Lonzo playing off the ball, I don't, that's fine. Do it. But I don't know if it helps your growth if you're going out in the second yeah, round. Yeah, stylistically, I think you make a good point. Speaking of stylistically, a nice Burberry shirt by Chris Broussard, who looks very Wall Street today. Do we and, think that's Bur- Is that it, Burberry? It's a very nice shirt. Thank you. It's a very Thank expensive, you. nice, tailored shirt. Is it not? It, 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 I, I, I like that image, so I'll let it play. <laughs> I, have my, I have my secrets, so I can yeah. – I'm a, I'm a value shopper. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Good for you, Chris. Good seeing you, buddy. All right, you too. All right, coming up next. Oh, my Lord. You had to laugh. The story I have next – sometimes you have to laugh in life. And something happened yesterday, and even a tough guy in the end had to laugh about it. That's next. The true car you can find what other people in your area pay for the same car you're looking for. Save three grand off MSRP. Visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. I just saw that Dodger promo. Seen the Dodgers play three times this year. Good God, they're good. And they win the same way every time. They start slow, six inning. All their batters start seeing for the third time that pitcher. Bang, bang, bang. Seager, Chris Taylor, Justin Turner. Boom. Belvinger, bang, bang, bang. Every game I've seen is the exact same way. Struggle for six, then then everybody sees the pitcher for the third time. I'm telling you, the Dodgers right now may become the greatest baseball team ever in a regular season. They can win 120 games. What? what? I mean, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I, I, listen, I'm not a guy that lives, breathes, eats, sleeps regular season baseball. That is as good a team. And they don't have Kershaw's not pitching. I mean, that lineup, they got Yasiel Puig hitting eighth. I mean, that team can, if you like, you can be a marginal baseball fan. You go to a Dodger game, like, they, that is a great batting order. I mean, what's amazing about it, it's not big stars. Chris Taylor starts the year in the minor leagues. Their big slugger starts the year in the minor leagues. It is a remarkable team. And sometimes it's lightning in a bottle and the personalities work. And they got Adrian Gonzalez coming back. I don't even know if they can play him. He's like an all-star. I don't even know they can get on the field. I can't believe I'm talking baseball. The Dodgers are 51 games over 500. They're 51 games over 500. We got 45 games to go. God, they are on fire, and they're a blast to watch. Okay, so Nick Saban does this, Christine, and he does this four or five times a year. And it's now become, I think it's funny now, that Nick Saban wants to complain about something and he goes to a press conference and he's going to try to find an opening or a segue to complain about what he wants to complain about. It has nothing to do with the reporter. It has nothing to do with the question that Nick is in a bad mood and he comes to that press conference. And I think it's funny now. It's just, it's become who Nick is. And I think, Hey, listen, it's funny. He's funny. They're actually, they become very funny. Every time he does it, I play it. So yesterday, Nick had something on his mind. He probably read a preseason prediction he didn't like. And somebody asked a completely harmless question about a sophomore linebacker. And that question set off this. Christian Miller was a guy that y'all relied on as kind of like a a reliable backup the last few years. What have you seen from him kind of emerging? It seems like he's going to be one of those pass rush guys. Who who, did you say? Christian Miller. Oh, I don't know. You know, you guys make all these predictions about everything, <laughs> about guys that are going to be great players that have been here for two years and who's going to win all the games. And I don't even know why we play. Why, why do we even play? Why do we even have practice? Why, why do we compete? Why do we coach guys? Why, how do they need to improve? I mean, you guys got all the answers to, I mean, how guys are going to be, what they're going to do. I don't even, I mean, sometimes I, I wonder – why, why, why do we play? I mean, why, why do we even have practice? Because you guys got all these conclusions already drawn about who's what, how good they are, what they can do. 
I mean, so why would you ask me? I mean, I, that's that's a product that's puzzling to me. Why would you ask me? I mean, I read stuff all the time like, oh, that's, that's nice to know. I mean, where'd that come from? And then you ask me? But Christian Miller has done a nice job. He's had a really good camp. <laughs> He's doing a good job. I mean, was had a lot of production points in the scrimmage, so we're really happy with his progress. Okay, thank you, Coach. And, you know, thanks for asking. Nick was just in a mood, and he wanted to get that out. You ever ask your mom or your dad for, like, a ride to a friend's house when you were a kid? Like, hey, Mom, could you just give me a ride to Jack's house? And she goes on a six-minute rant on NAFTA or global warming, and you're like, well, mom's in a bad mood. Mom just had to get that off her chest. And it, mom's not really mad at me. I shouldn't take it personally. Mom's just mad. She had a bad day. And uh, maybe she was bringing groceries from a store or something and got bad service or the bag broke. Or maybe her and dad got in a fight. And then five minutes later, after mom rips NAFTA and global warming, mom goes, yeah, let's go. Let's get in the car and go. And then mom's done with it. Like, or when your wife asks you to help with the dishes and then it's not really about the dishes. She wants you to want to do the dishes. First of all, let me tell you something. Nobody wants to do the dishes. No, but you should want to help. Okay, that's different. My wife said that. Yeah, like the I remember the trash situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No guy wants to do dishes and take out the trash. So you should want a happy wife. I want to go watch the Dodgers win another (laughs) series and have an IPA. I don't want to take out the garbage. Then you're gonna want your wife to stay with you and not divorce you. My wife is a beautiful person. Did I tell you she went vegan? Have you ever tried vegan bacon? Don't. It's not bacon. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, He's it, cranky, isn't he? No, listen, I like Nick Saban. I really do. I really like Nick Saban. People think I don't like him. I, I think he's a little bit of a hypocrite on the what players get suspended, what players don't. It largely depends on what's the depth chart look like. Ooh, left tackle, we're thin. That guy's okay. Right guard, we're loaded. Yeah, that guy, kick him off the team. I think he can be a hypocrite, but I do think all coaches can. But I, I just think this has become part and parcel of what Nick is. He's got something he wants to complain about, and he went to that press conference, and he's just looking for a chance to complain about it. He probably heard a prediction. He didn't like the prediction. He was ticked off. He wanted to get that out. And by the way, at the end, he's laughing about it because he knows he's being ridiculous. He literally knows at the end, I'm just being ridiculous about this. And I guarantee you Nick Saban gets home and his wife is like, oh, good God, what was wrong with you today? What are you doing? That's just the way sometimes, sometimes in life, people just in a bad mood, don't take it personally. They're ticked off. They were stuck in traffic. They start yelling. It's nothing against you. Let them have their space. And then in the end, they blow the steam off and they just go. I told you this before with my wife sometimes. Sometimes she has a bad day. I sit down. We pour a a nice glass of wine. And my wife goes for about 15 minutes. And I don't know exactly what she's talking about. But she needed to talk. And I allow her the space to vent because she's been dealing with kids all day. And our dog, which is needy. And she just needs to vent. And I am there to be the dartboard sometimes. And I'm totally okay with it. Okay. And then she says, take the garbage out, and then we fight. That's all I'm saying. I I do think think it's sort of interesting that this Conor McGregor-Mayweather fight, this is what's really interesting about this, is everybody in the media is getting caught up now on the Nevada Athletic Commission allowing 8-ounce gloves from 10-ounce gloves. And I would just say this. It's boxing. Caveat emptor. Boxers who agree to box with a certain glove, I'm okay with. ISIS finds people not part of ISIS and injures them. Boxers only hurt boxers. And every boxer knows going in what boxing is. Come yeah, on. but this whole glove thing sets a precedent. I think that's what people are upset about. It's And, and it's true, like... Yes, they're going to make this one-time exception, but they're also allowing a boxer that has a perfect record to fight someone who's never boxed. Um, but I'm, it does set the precedent. Like, moving forward, if one guy asks for a different glove size, you have to now consider it. Okay, you consider it and say no. I, I, th- I just think it opens the doors. Then if Connor stays in boxing, what does that look like? Boxing's never been unified. State to state, weight class to weight class, rule to rule. They're not hurting other people. Two great champions have agreed to terms on gloves. So to, to my thing is, okay, they're not affecting me or you, just themselves, the herd. Ah, 
Bob. This is The Herd. Wherever you may be and however you may be listening, live from Los Angeles, iHeartRadio, Fox Sports Radio, and FS1. Absolute pleasure to be here for hour number two today. Floyd Mayweather Sr. in 30 minutes, Doug Gottlieb in five minutes, and Christine Leahy is joining me as always. We're getting closer to the fight. We've got the LeBron story apparently wants out of Cleveland. It's a 100% done deal. They're denying it. LeBron is and others are. Uh, I, I want to start with this again. And this is just the way the world works. I am not picking on anybody, Christine, talking about McGregor and Mayweather. So yesterday, the Nevada Athletic Commission approved using 8-ounce gloves smaller than 10-ounce gloves. And there was some outcry from boxing purists. This is unethical. Let's be honest about this, could we? There are certain places, New Orleans, the Ozarks, Miami, Nevada, you put that name in front of commission, let me just say it feels like things are negotiable, if you know what I'm saying. You know what I mean? States are different. Some conservative, some liberal. California's got lots of regulations. Texas, not so much. States without regulations. How you doing? Stuff's a little more negotiable. If you know what I mean. If there was a Nevada Dental Commission, don't you feel like if they did a study on toothpaste, it would take longer than anticipated and they would eventually recommend Marlboro Reds toothpaste with menthol? Come on, you know it's true. If there was a New Orleans Tourism Commission, don't you feel like maybe somebody got a car out of it? I'm not picking on Nevada. I lived in Las Vegas and love Lake Tahoe and Reno. But you do get why boxing matches are often held in Vegas, don't you? Fewer regulations. I used to live in Portland, Oregon, and most of you know that. For a long time, over a decade, they wouldn't allow pro wrestling. And pro wrestling would not come there. I should restate that. They would allow it, but they wanted to test for steroids and HGH and all sorts of stuff. And the WWE could sell tickets in Portland, but said, we're going to pass on that. <laughs> we'll just go up to uh, California and we'll go to Washington and we'll go to New Jersey and we'll get. Pro wrestling would not go to Portland, Oregon for years. Why? Regulations. I got nothing against the Nevada Athletic Commission. But when you put Nevada in front of a commission, it just sounds like crap's negotiable. Nevada Athletic Commission sounds like rock stars pharmacist. It doesn't sound like Mormon Tabernacle Choir. The Nevada Athletic Commission sounds like the Ozarks Moonshine Regulation Committee. Somebody got a houseboat out of that deal. There's a reason they fight in Nevada. Atlantic City is not just the casinos, man. Businesses often move state to state, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, based on taxes and regulation. I am not outraged by 10-ounce gloves to 8-ounce gloves. I am more outraged that the world's greatest fighter is going to fight a guy who kicks and wrestles. And they put a quick stamp on that. The other story today, and it is significant, Chris Sheraton, longtime NBA reporter, tweets, that with 100% certainty, LeBron James is not staying in Cleveland. When there were those around Chris Sheraton, or around LeBron, excuse me, that denied it, Chris Sheraton's second tweet was also telling. He said, stop being disingenuous, i.e., you're the ones that gave it to me. Stop denying it. Somebody, in my opinion, surrounding the LeBron camp with knowledge. Sheraton was very good on LeBron leaving the heat. Somebody around that camp, not saying the wife, not saying Maverick Carter, not saying his attorney, not saying that. Sheraton's got a history with LeBron. There's a precedent here of having some inside information. And with that, let's bring in my friend. He is knocking it out of the park on Fox Sports Radio. Knows his football as well. Doug Gottlieb joining us on the show today. All right, listen, I said this earlier. Um, 
I see guys on the internet in their 20s breaking stories, but my natural proclivity is to uh, uh, listen to people in their late 30s, 40s, 50s when it comes to breaking stories because they have this archive of information. Chris Sheraton has been accurate before, like a Peter Vesey. Doesn't have to be actively on my Twitter account, but he's been accurate a lot. What do you make of Chris Sheraton's initial tweet? If LeBron James was staying, wouldn't he say he was staying? You know, that that's really kind of what it comes down to. It's a lot like... Um, If you ask a friend who's in a long-term relationship, dating relationship, and you ask him, hey, are you guys going to get married? Is she the one? And he's like, well, you know, I don't know. Like, well, you don't know. You actually do know. You're not willing to say (laughs) what you know. That's exactly right. And that's exactly what we have here between LeBron and Dan Gilbert. These two were married. They got divorced. They tried to get back together for for the kids, right? In this case, the kids is Cleveland and Akron. And all that's important to LeBron off the basketball floor and bringing a championship to his home area. But at the end of the day, they're two very different people with two very different ways of seeing the world. And no matter how much each side has tried to make it work, it's not going to make it work. And, and there was another tweet which I thought was even more telling, which was Rick Buecher, who, of course, another guy who's covered this thing for 20 years. He has his own radio a, show. I, I consider him a friend. I like him a lot. Buke's great. And Buke said, hey, it's important to remember that Dan Gilbert gave $750,000 to the Trump inauguration. And why why does that matter? If you've been following LeBron James, he's twice tweeted at the president of the United States, you know, allowing hate speech to become more a part of the the daily conversation. Normalized. Right, to normalize it. And I just... I just bring from my background and I, your life, and I'm sure Christine, same thing. Regardless of whether or not we want to remain apolitical, like, look, it, it, it's not, it, I, I don't have to, we don't have to engage on every conversation. I guarantee that there's somebody in your life supporting one side or the other that in this, politi- this political divide, it's not a debate, right? It really, it's really Trump ignited. It, it is. Um, going back to the presidential election season, even to now, you've lost a friend over this thing. Yep. And these two weren't friends. And uh, of all the things that LeBron just can't probably uh, come to grips with, dude, I can't make money for, work for a guy who's going to give $750,000 to somebody that I am vehemently opposed to running our country. Yeah. I think that's a very reasonable reason, among others, to leave Cleveland. Yeah, let me tell you something. Uh, I have made... Um People that aren't even political that I would that I would call apolitical, yeah, are now political. That's my wife. I, for years, mine I was, too. I, I was I, I was into the political process. I love watching debates. I like I love watching how things and watching the maps and how it's changed and the pendulum swinging. You know, even if I didn't take a side, you end up un, just kind of taking a step back and taking it all in. She never wanted to watch it, and now she's I guess woke would be like right. She can't. And, and but on the other hand, it drives me away from it because the, any time you engage, you are becoming polarizing. And it's interesting. Like, look, we're even guilty of it here at Fox Sports 1. Um, Hugh Jackson was called out by Shannon Sharp because he didn't want to engage in political discussion during training camp. He's like, look, we're just trying to win football games <laughs> in course. Cleveland, something that no one has done for 25 years. And I, I think... I, I completely agree with you that people who are apolitical have now become very politically woken up. Yeah, and uh, and 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 I and that's why I've said during Obama's eight years, athletes weren't protesting. Athletes feel they have to now because they are so discouraged. And I'm not taking side. I'm just saying I'm going to side with the athletes on this because I'm not a fan of Trump. But what has happened in the last year in our lives is apoliticals become political, and I I I think it I think it's Trump ignited. Okay, so let's go to this. Um, I had Michael Vick on yesterday. Uh-huh. He did something I uh, was intensely bothered by. He then went to a federal prison and showed incredible remorse and culpability. I'm not going to forget it, but I'm going to forgive him. And yesterday, after I had him on, um, I got a lot of pushback. And I'm like, well, I put Richie Incognito on, and I hated him four years ago. And I've put Ray Lewis on, and there's some baggage there and some people, a well-documented story. And it's it's interesting uh, with Michael Vick is very interesting. I went to dinner with him last night. I like. Thanks him. for the invite, by the way. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I did. I went with a bunch of people to dinner, and Michael was in the group. And I like Michael Vick. Yeah, but it's really interesting. Um, we live in a pile on culture now, and I don't think I'm contrarian, but I often take the opposite side because I think there's a human involved here. And where do you land on Vick? Where you know, I, I love animals. I was disgusted. 
He served time. He's remorseful. I don't have a problem bringing him on. I, I don't either. I mean, like, look, I, I call my own personal history. I committed a crime when I was at Notre Dame. And if you follow me on Twitter, there are people that will tweet even at my wife or get on her Facebook page and tell tell her that she's married to a criminal. Like, right. yeah, dude, it was a misdemeanor. It was 20 years ago. What have I done ever since? That's right. Obviously, his crimes were more grievous and hers were against an animal. I'm like like you. I have a cat. I have a dog. Uh, but and I'm also a human being. Um, but, you know, what has he done since? And unlike others who have done these things to animals, he actually served j- jail time and he wears the scarlet letter. Like there's not anybody who doesn't know that portion of the Mike Vick story. They may not know anything before. They may have forgotten much after, but everybody knows that. And I think he continues to pay that that penance for his crimes because he's Mike Vick and because he wears that scarlet letter. You can't walk a mile in his shoe. I, I can't think of somebody who's better to have on in, in these turbulent times than somebody who has been through the ups and the downs and now fighting his way back up to where he's a respected member of the NFL community. And what, why I, I, I fail to see, and it's always interesting to me, the people that say that they live by what they read from the Bible don't, under, don't actually read the context of the Bible where it says to forgive and forget, you know, if you, if you accept responsibility. He hasn't run from it. He's been accountable to it. You can ask him on the air about it. And he'll answer it. Of course he will. Last and that's and by the way, that's the only way in which you handle any of these issues is when you're accountable. It shows what kind of human being, what kind of man you are. If you say, I did it, I was wrong, let me tell you what I've done ever since. Uh, so uh, in Vegas, Nevada Athletic Commission says, 10-ounce gloves, let's go to eight. Uh, this is like, uh, to me, it, it, that's not the issue. I think I know why they're doing it. I think you know why they're doing it. It's creating reasonable doubt. Isn't that what it is? <laughs> exactly. I mean, this, this is all the defense attorneys do, right? You just have to create reasonable doubt in order to acquit. For for us, I have to have reasonable doubt to believe that Conor McGregor, who is great in the octagon, can somehow can somehow have a puncher's chance to take out the greatest pound for pound fighter in boxing. And that's all they're trying to do between the leaked video from Dana, between uh, Floyd having the sit down interview with Stephen A where even Stephen A. was in his over-the-top Stephen, are you telling me that Floyd Mayweather, <laughs> right in here and now, can't be beaten? And he's like, look, I'm, I'm not the same. I'm, I'm slower. You can, you, I can be had right now. And now, then you take the, bo- the gloves from 10 to 8, okay? And they fight, I think, what, what three-ounce gloves, yeah. four-ounce gloves? So the perception now right, is... is puncher's chance, reasonable doubt. Hey, I'm not saying this is like, uh, what was it? Uh, not something about our dumb and dumber, right? Uh, I'm... You're saying there's a chance, right? One in a million. You're saying there's a chance. This, there's a puncher's chance. They're creating reasonable doubt. It's the only marketing ploy that they can possibly make us believe could happen. And I think the opposite's going to happen, that Mayweather, who's going to land the more punches, will just bloody Mayweather sooner because um, I still think he's going to land 95% of the punches. It's like when years ago there was great fear that if you raised the speed limit, people would die. In fact, the opposite happened because the market went, "Uh uh-oh, we got to build safer cars. So car manufacturers understand, nobody wrote the story about the car manufacturer. The car manufacturer went, oh, let's build safer cars. What happened? Car deaths plummeted. The perception is, oh, this gives Connor an edge. I would argue it gives Floyd a better chance to land more punches because Connor will now see it as, oh, I'm going to go after him, leaving himself more vulnerable to the better fighter. Correct. And, and as I thought, uh, it was a Jay Glazer you had on yesterday. It's, it's, it's such a, the, how, you're, how you move, uh, where you have to, if you've, you've been to a UFC fight, I went to, what, 214 at, in Anaheim, right? Remember, you're not just guarding against punches. You have to, you know, you have to guard against somebody shooting for your legs. You got to worry about kicks. Yes. Okay, so your defenses are not always the same, whereas in boxing, you know, a guy might be coming straight at you, but the angles are completely, completely different. This is, you know, it's, I, I would, when you watch the big three on, uh, on Fox Sports 1 on Monday night, yeah. right? Three on three basketball is different than five on five basketball. It's no different. This is a different discipline, and I would agree with you that the opposite of the, the intended consequence is to make you believe that Conor McGregor yes. has a puncher's chance. The unintended consequence <laughs> is Floyd Mayweather, who does have much greater power. He has power. What he's done in these recent fights is he's gotten ahead early. 
and then gone delay game, yeah. right? Just run away. Four corners. Four, went four corners. And now he knows that he'll have a little bit of a defenseless fighter, and I think he will take his shot smartly because he's a he's an absolute savant inside that ring. Yeah. Name is Doug Gottlieb. His radio show is amazing. I, on, on social media, it's always making news and doing stuff. It's great seeing you. Good to see you. Floyd Mayweather Sr. is around the corner, about 15 minutes away. So, uh, I'm, is Jay Cutler plays tonight? Holy moly! Jay Cutler debuts for the Miami Dolphins tonight. And I was thinking about this. I know a lot of people said, uh, you know, Kaepernick should have gotten that job and stuff. And I uh, still feel Kaepernick will probably get signed by somebody eventually. 65 quarterbacks took a snap last year. He's one of the top probably 45, 40 in America, maybe 35 or something like that. Um, never had a problem with him kneeling. Uh, but I, I, I think if you invite him into a locker room, what if you had to cut him? That could be problematic. They're just He's very, very newsworthy like Tim Tebow or Johnny Mandel, and I view him as a backup. But here's a prime example. Jay Glazer, of all the NFL reporters that I've ever worked with, has the best relationship with players. Peter King may have the best relationship with owners and some stars. Peter Schrager, uh, Adam Schefter, they're all great. They're all fantastic. Ed Werder, all, all these guys are really, really tied in. Jay's got a very unique relationship with players because he has a business, a gym business, and he trains them. Aaron Rodgers was just there. Jay is very, very close to players. If Jay says something about players and coaches, he ain't, he's not just making this stuff up. He doesn't confirm reports. He breaks them. And yesterday he talked about when Ryan Tannehill went down, there was a psychology in play here. And they went and got Jay Cutler, and Gla- we, that's what we said, and Glazer backed it up yesterday. And I sat up here with, with Adam Gase and, and uh, different executives of the team, and they all said the same thing. What we wanted to do is show the world, but especially our locker room, we're not giving up. Like, we're there. We felt we made big strides last year, and we can't just – we didn't want to have a pity party for ourselves. So by us going out and getting a guy like Jay Cutler, it sent a message to everybody in that locker room that we're not just going to sit idly by and say, oh, woe was me. We lost our quarterback. Or in other words, they were able to sell to the locker room, hey, the movie's still going on. If you were doing a movie and the star – Went down three weeks before, broken leg, two broken legs. Jay Cutler's Nicolas Cage. Some say he's washed up. Some say he was never that good. But he is viewed as a number one. Lower end one, but a one. Quirky, enigmatic both. Kaepernick is more viewed as Christopher Walken. By the way, won an Oscar. Been to a Super Bowl. But Christopher Walken, if a movie loses its star and you replace him with Christopher Walken, is he viewed as a movie star? No, he's not. Christopher Walken's a two or a three. That Kaepernick is viewed by a lot of people, including a lot of players in this league. He's a backup. Came into this league as a backup. Eventually Harbaugh left. Couldn't beat out Blaine Gabbert. Pre-knee as a backup. Second round pick, small school. Backup. Big schools didn't offer him. Cutler's seen as a star. SEC, led his team, Denver, Chicago. If the movie three weeks before the movie's going to be made, the star's out, to save the thousands of employees, people that have put time in, to save the psychology of the room, you got to get a star. Nobody thinks Nick Cage is Cruz, but Nick Cage is enough of Cruz, you can sell it to the production people. You can sell it to the box office. You can't sell Christopher Walken as a star, even though I could argue he's more talented. Probably is. So I've always said this about Jay Cutler. You may not like Jay. He may be enigmatic. He may be troubled. He may be underachieving. I'm not denying any of that stuff. But we got three weeks to go in a system, and he's played with a coach and had success. Psychologically, as Jay Glazer pointed out, it saved the room. And a lot of times you're making moves as a college or pro football coach, basketball coach, to save the room, to keep the spirit high. That's the reality of a lot of situations. So when they chose Cutler over Cap, I'm like, no, I totally get it. Jay Glazer, who talks to players and coaches, confirmed it yesterday. It felt like, okay, we were a playoff team. We still can be a playoff team. We've got a star. Nick Cage level, but we got one. Christine with the news. No, 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 no. Turn on the news. This is the Herdline News. 
According to reports, the Bulls are expected to agree to a buyout with Dwayne Wade at some point in the next few months. He opted into the $23.8 million left on the contract for the rest of this season. I think that makes sense, and I like the direction that the Bulls are going in if they really are going to rebuild and Dwayne Wade. So they're going to buy him out and let him go? Yeah. And he'll go back to where? Oh, gosh. Miami. You think? Well, I mean, can no, you just... No, I think he left there on pretty bad terms. Really? Yes. Where can you see Dwayne Wade playing? Cleveland? I mean, it feels like to me he'd come back and go, I made a huge mistake. No way. No way. You don't think so? No. They love him in Miami. I think he left there on really bad terms. And remember, the whole reason that he left is, is because he felt like he wasn't getting the money that he deserved. Can we do one of those so cheesy gonna polls go, today? So he's going to go back... And take even less money? Let's do one of those rules. That's like going back with your tail between your legs. I do that Monday through Friday. Why can't you? Let's do one of those bad Insta polls. Would Miami accept Dwayne Wade back? No, no, no. The question has to be, would Dwayne Wade go back to, or where does Dwayne Wade go next? It's Miami. No. Am I wrong? Yes. Everybody goes back to Miami. Don't they? Everybody they go back to Cali. <laughs> Good one. Tip of the touche there. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Durant and Lil Dicky. Excuse me? A rapper. Okay. Uh, got into a Twitter conversation that I personally love because I'm a big fan of Lil Dicky. I have been for many years. Okay. I'll have to play some of his songs for you after I'm, the show. I'm, You're going to love them. Okay. Uh, so the conversation they had on Twitter is great because it's it's like a conversation that anybody would have, but a lot of people got to see it, and it was it was uh, not mean, not hateful. It was just an educated discussion. So Lil Dicky started with saying that if I'm Cleveland, I'm 1,000% trading LeBron. And so his point being, if he's going to leave anyways, I might as well get something for him this time rather than wait it out. So Kevin Durant saw this tweet from Lil Dicky and responded that you can't trade a legend. He's Cleveland. He gets to hold the cards. Makes a lot of sense, too. Then Lil Dicky responded, he did it. They won. If I'm him, I despise Gilbert for a variety of reasons. But if I'm Gilbert, I'm getting something back this time. He's gone. And then Kevin Durant said, I feel like what you're saying, most owners think that way. But then you realize that it's LeBron James. Last time he left, they got like three number one picks. So either way, they're good. Um, Both making good points. I think Kevin Durant makes the better points. But I just really enjoy when people have conversations like this that millions of people can see. And that I get to introduce you to someone like Bill Dickey. That is the win for everyone. It's a real win. I met him at a Laker game one time or a Clipper game. I don't know. And finally, uh, Julian Edelman was talking about Wes Welker. You know, the Texans are having uh, practices with the Patriots. And Wes Welker is now a Texans assistant coach. Uh, so Julian Edelman actually credited him for inventing the position that he currently plays, that slot receiver kind of quick guy, Yeah. Um, which I thought was pretty cool of Julian Edelman to give that credit to Walker. Well, somebody would have eventually done it. I think Edelman deserves credit for Edelman. I always hear stuff like that, like Howard Stern invented blank. It's like the b- people were doing edgy stuff in the media, like Steve Allen in- created Letterman. It's like, now Letterman was pretty talented. Like, I, I, I listen, I love Wes Welker. But eventually, the slot receiver position, it was starting to happen anyway. Welker and Brady made it a big deal. Yeah. But football's always figured out different ways to move the football. And three so he's step- the guy who made it popular. He, yes, he, he was. When we think of slot receiver, you're right. We do think of Welker. Yes. Like, he's the first guy we think of. Yes. Christine with the news. Well, that's the news. And thanks for stopping by. The Herd Lie News. I've said it before. I think Floyd Mayweather will win the fight. Floyd will win every round. Conor McGregor will land almost no punches. Floyd Mayweather Sr. now, a boxing trainer and a former boxer, is sitting alongside us on the couch. Hello, sir. How are you? How are you doing? I am good. I don't think the fight will be competitive. Please take a seat here if you could. All right. Pull that microphone right up. So they have changed gloves from 10 ounces to 8 ounces, uh, Mr. Mayweather. Yeah. Who gets the advantage on that? Well, you know, first of all, first of all, uh, you can't hit what you can't see. And Floyd is never right there in a particular place where he going to just lay there where you can pound on him and hit on him and all that. He don't do that. He make you miss. And so regardless and of... And make you pay. And so my takeaway is smaller gloves, 
mean Floyd, who's going to land more punches anyway, will just land more exactly. punches. Exactly. Exactly. You got it. You got it. Very correct. Okay. Now, here's my question, though. I don't think your son is taking this fight as seriously, and I don't blame him. How can the world's greatest anything fighting an absolute novice take it as seriously? Michael Jordan did not take the Toronto Raptors as seriously as the Detroit Pistons. When Tom Brady faces Peyton Manning, he's all in. How can Tom Brady see the Jacksonville Jaguars? Your son can't possibly think he can lose this fight. What's his training like? His training is good. Good, not great. I'm saying it's good enough. Okay, so it's, are you admitting it's not the most intense training? Well, um, I could say a many times many time before it was better, but I'm saying here now he's training good enough for a guy like this. Conor McGregor has only one chance, in my opinion. He has to go after Floyd. He's, the longer this fight goes, it's and, and And when he go at Floyd, that's when he's going to get all the daylight whooped out of him. Because that's the only way to win, right? Like, like Connor's not going to win a 10-round fight. He ain't going to win a 10-round fight. He ain't gonna, but he can, I'm going to tell you, even if he, if he fight in a four-rounder, he ain't going to win that either. But he is bigger. He is quirky. He's a left-hander. Floyd's never fought anybody like this. He's different. Nope. Let me explain something to you. Okay, okay. I want to hear this. Nope. Uh, Floyd had fought many. Uh, 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 he fought many left-handers, mm -hmm. and uh, no, no real problems. Okay. What about this? Connor is going to try to make this a dirty fight. Connor's thinking. Listen, I'm going to be chippy. I'm going to hit him in the back. Rabbit punch. And that's going to throw... Floyd's going to get ticked off. No, no, no. That's going to stop right there. Why? It's going to stop right there. Why? It's going to stop there. And guess what? Then we're going to throw a big suit at him. That's a a lawsuit? Of course. So you would sue Conor McGregor if he did that? Of course he would. Why, 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 why wouldn't you? So you've already that, that's not that's not that's not that, that that ain't the way we planned it. We ain't planned it like that. He came the box. That's what he thought he could. That's what he thought he could do. But now he's finna find out. Is the Mayweather camp discuss the possibility of suing McGregor if he goes dirty? No, no Mayweather discuss that. That's that's me. That's me. So you will sue. There's enough people around here. Suing everybody for nothing. And this is something that you can be screwed for. <laughs> so this would be something instead of nothing. Exactly. But you, you, know, you just told us, this seems to me to be news. You told me about four or five minutes ago that Floyd is training, but it's not his best training. Why was he so willing to go from 10 ounces to 8 ounces? Why would Floyd allow that? Why would Floyd do that? He's the champ. Why would he do that gimmicky stuff? Well, what, what, what do you mean? L letting? I mean, it's, it's kind of gimmicky. Floyd's the man. Why okay. would he allow that silliness? Well, you know what? That should tell you one thing. What's it tell me? It should tell you one thing. That the guy don't have what it takes. I'm just telling you. Who, Floyd or Connor? Connor don't have what it takes. Because I'm, I'm just telling you, Floyd is much faster. Still, yes. still at his age right now, he's much faster. I'm faster than Connor. You know, I'm faster than Connor right now today. As I, we speak. I, I, I don't. I think you're right. I don't doubt any of that. I think Floyd's going to win the fight, win every round. I, I, I doubt Connor lands two punches. But why would Floyd allow smaller gloves? Is that just? I mean, let's be honest. Is he want to sell more well, tickets? Well, well let me, no, no, I'm not saying that about Floyd. I think that. Uh, if Floyd allowed him to do it, Floyd's the man. Mm -hmm. If Floyd allowed him to do it, Floyd know what he's doing. He didn't fought in eight ounces many and many a times. 
He fought in eight ounces more than he ever fought in ten ounces. Okay, so he's comfortable with that. You you gonna find out? I'm just okay. Oh, I'm, I'm just tell you. I'm just tell you. Don't you listen to me. Look at TV. Okay, when 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 we got this video about uh, Pauli Malignaggi was the sparring partner, and Connor knocks him down, and there's a you know the, that video was out there. Dana White released the footage of of Connor knocking down his sparring partner. What did you make of that? What did that mean to you? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. I mean, that was a joke, man. Them two, neither one of them can fight. Now, come on. Um, look, man. Look, look, man. Look, I'm being real for you, man. You, you, you told you. If you get me here, man, I'm being real with you, man. They cannot fight either one of them. It seems a bit harsh. Okay. Okay. Can, can yeah, I? It's harsh, but it's true. All right. You're keeping it. Okay. Now, I want a prediction. I don't want you to give me all fluff. Prediction what's going to happen. I want one right now. A real prediction. You've been honest with me. You said you might sue. You said it's not a fight. I want honesty. Prediction. Floyd wins. Well, what that doesn't mean. Of course he wins. Of course he wins. Does he win quick? Does he win knockout? Uh, I'm, I'm the one that can't tell you that because... If it was me, I would tell you right now. What round I knock him out and everything else. But hey, right now, this is somebody else. Okay, has Floyd told you privately? Has he told you he wants to knock him out? No, he has not. Has he told you he's ticked off at Connor? Ta- Connor made some jokes that were very pointed, and many people said inappropriate. Well, whatever he said, that whatever he said that uh, kind of offensive that ticked him off, right? Well, you know, it's going to give him something else to be ticked off about. Okay. And I think you know what it's going to be. I think you know what it is, don't you? What? Good A whooping. You didn't have to whisper that. You could have screamed that out, actually. You think he's going to kick his arse? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. All right. Uh, by the way, I think I appreciate you telling us. You were very honest about this. It's not Floyd's best training, but you said it's good enough. Well, you, you can't I, you can't tell me Floyd's well, looking at Connor thinking, "Boy, I I could lose this fight." No, 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 no. I'm I'm look look man. First of all, Connor first of all, then showed showed the whole world his A. And I think you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. And guess what? You don't think he can fight? It ain't nothing. Yeah, he can't fight. He can't fight. Floyd Mayweather Sr., thank you for stopping by, sir. Back in a second in L.A., it's the Herd. So funny. People love honesty until they don't agree with it. And then they hate honesty. Coward, I love how honest you are. You keep it real all the time. Yeah, I think Matt Ryan's this much better than Andy Dalton. You like that in Atlanta? All you fanboys? Take out Matt Ryan's worst year, best year. What is he? 11% better than Andy Dalton. You're comparing him to Aaron Rodgers. You used to send me tweets you loved how honest I was. Data backs it up. Data backs it up. I love Coward is so honest. Wait, I don't agree with him. I hate Cowherd. By the way, you Matt Ryan fanboys, you Russell Westbrook fanboys, you Conor McGregor fanboys, would you like me better if I sanitize my thoughts on that fight? Conor McGregor is not going to win that fight. Floyd's going to win the fight. He's going to win every round. He's going to dominate. Conor McGregor's almost not going to hit him. I do think the shrinking of gloves makes it more compelling. It makes me think it's more compelling, even though I know it's not. But my guess is Floyd gets the advantage on that, not Conor McGregor. Yeah, you know, I, I, I I laugh people love honesty until they don't agree with it. Then they hate it. You can't have it both ways. I'm not the hypocrite. You are. Like Matt Ryan is not close to Aaron Rodgers. He is closer statistically if you take out his best year and his worst year to Andy Dalton. That's what the data says. Put the pom-poms down. Conor McGregor has no chance to win this fight. One in a thousand. Oh, I'm sorry, keeping it real, UFC fanboy. You liked me an hour earlier. Now you hate me. Do you want your commentators to be honest? If you do, 
then you have to accept opinions you don't like. I think Trump's a lousy president. I don't go on and on because I'm not a political show. Sorry if you don't like it. I don't think that's being political. I just think it's being honest. Everybody's seeking honesty. Wait, I disagree with it. You're a jerk. When I look at this fight, I don't know how in the world you can think Conor McGregor can win this fight. (laughs) I don't know how in the world. You're asking a decathlon to beat Usain Bolt in the sprint. It'd be one thing if we had an octagon and you could kick. Then I'd like Conor. Heck, if, if Connor and Floyd met in the corner of that studio, no gloves, I'd take Connor. But it's all boxing rules. Of course Floyd's going to win the fight. Now, I do think the UFC has done a pretty good job to create this sense that smaller gloves, puncher's chance, Floyd's a little older. Even Floyd's dad just admitted that Floyd isn't training to the level he perhaps did with a Pacquiao. I think that I think Connor's best chance is to get a Floyd that hasn't prepared very much. Because I'll tell you that there's a history and a precedent in boxing. Heavy fa- Muhammad Ali, I, I, and I could be wrong on this, Goulet, you can look it up, the Jimmy Young fight. Like there's a history in boxing where very few boxers gave you the same level of training each and every fight. It, it's when you're a heavy favorite, if it's a setup fight, even some great champions, Ali against Foreman, a magnificent performance against Frazier. But there were times Muhammad Ali did not. I mean, let's be honest. Go back and look at Michael Jordan. Look this up, John. Go back to the 72-10 and 10 Chicago Bulls right now. I am directing that John Goulet. So the 72-10 and 10 Chicago Bulls, and even though Golden State beat that record, we think Chicago's the best team ever. So you would think to yourself, Colin, the teams that beat Michael Jordan that year, it must have been the Pistons and the Lakers. It must have been the, uh, the best team. I mean, they were, the, they were so amazing that year. Nobody could beat the Chicago. Go back and look at the 72-10 year. Who beat John Goulet? Am I crazy, or did the Toronto Raptors, who were at the time dog food, they were awful. They could have been an expansion team. Go back and look who beat them that year. And that's the great Michael Jordan. That's the unsinkable, unkillable Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan never took a day off. Michael Jordan's the greatest of all time. Michael Jordan could shoot baskets for nine hours and then go play a game and then go shoot baskets for nine hours. Michael Jordan never took a game off. Who beat him that year, John? They did lose to the Raptors. Yes, they did. To arguably the first or second worst team in the league. Michael Jordan's Bulls lost to the Raptors. That, to me, is Connor's shot. Is that Floyd is just not emotionally or physically at his best level. And when you combine that with he's also now older, so he's not as good. He has to train. Like Brady now is really good because Brady's training harder than he did at 26. And Tom would tell you that. We have video yesterday of Tom Brady talking to Jay Glazer. Look how thin Brady is. He's in the best shape of his life. So to me, that's the end. The end's not skill, punching. It's that Floyd potentially comes in a little what they call fat and happy. A, a, a little fat and happy. But it, it, it is interesting. We, I think sometimes in sports, and, and I, we do this all the time in sports, we forget the psychology of sports. Listen, we're all human beings here. I'm going to be honest with you. When it's a Monday during the football season, man, I am totally locked in as a radio host. Sometimes it's like a Wednesday in July, and it doesn't feel the same. And I'm still doing a good show, and I'm putting in the prep. But the I, let's be honest. When you drive to work knowing you have a big meeting, are you not more focused than you are driving to work the day before a vacation? <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, we, we're all human beings here. There are just moments in time and meetings and, you know, I, I, you walk. Listen, I, I, when, I, when, when you're a single guy and you just know, <clears throat> wow, you go on Tinder or whatever you young kids go on. And that person is, he is handsome. She is beautiful. At least in the picture. You're kind of locked in a little more. Let's face it. If you're a woman, guy looks like me on Tinder, you're like, I can mail it in, be 20 minutes late, barely talk. 
looks like uh, Brady, you're like, whoo, got to bring my A game. Better perfume, nicer dress. The whole point is you don't go on dates all this. You have a different psychology based on who you're dating. Or you wonder if that picture is real and you're going to meet someone else when you show up at the bar. I think you're missing the point of Tinder. It's because you don't want to put in any effort. Yeah. I think those people on Tinder, I think they want to fall in love too. Some of them. You can be cynical. I think love exists even on Tinder. Yeah, but they just don't want to put the effort in. Tinder is like, I don't have to go ask someone out or go to a bar or ask my coworker. Or well, that's probably not right. But you're yeah. on an app and you're like, cool, I arranged a date I'll through an what, app. I don't go on Tinder. You know why? Because love means something to me. Well, you're also married. And <laughs> I think there's probably a different app for you Third. if you wanted to use it. <laughs> This is The Herd, wherever you may be and however you may be listening. Hour three, live in Los Angeles, iHeartRadio, Fox Sports Radio, and FS1. Seth Joyner is fantastic. Three Super Bowl rings, Super Bowl champ multiple times in studio. In 25 minutes, I got breaking news in the NFL. Holy moly. What is the organization that drives me crazy because they won't support their young star quarterback, the Indianapolis Colts? Ryan Kelly, their best offensive lineman, their young center, out for two months, going to have surgery, something wrong with his feet, really good at Alabama, had a nice rookie year, Andrew Luck not playing yet. His best offensive lineman, Ryan Kelly, is out. This is breaking my Colts, I told you when I made my when I made my um predictions for the NFL, I had the right to change them. I am taking wins away from the Colts, Christine. I will take some wins away. I think that's fair to do before the season starts, but once the season starts, no more. Yeah, it'd be like it's it, like fantasy. Yeah, like I can't go in week fifteen and say, I suddenly like this team to go twelve well, and I'm gonna even say you can't do that after week one. Okay, so I get a change until the season starts. Yes. Colts, you just lost a couple of games. Uh, Seth Joyner joining us in 30 minutes. I want, though, to start with this. I'm an opinion guy. Uh, I don't have access to a lot of locker rooms. I could, but it's not what I do anymore, so I am an opinion guy. I don't consider myself some grand journalist. I do understand journalism. I do understand there are certain principles, get things double-sourced. But um, I tend to lean on people who have a history, not a 22-year-old blogger. Give me a 50-year-old NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball guy that's been doing it a long time, that has built up an archive of sources. And yesterday, Chris Sheraton has been doing this a long, long time, covering the NBA since the Peter Vesey days, that kind of thing. David Aldridge, NBA sources said today, quote, this will be LeBron's final season in Cleveland. He is 100% leaving relationship with owners beyond repair. Okay, let's think about that. Who is Chris Sheraton? The same guy that was way ahead of the crowd three years ago reporting LeBron would likely leave the heat for the Cavs, which obviously happened. There's a precedent. There's a history. He's been right before on LeBron. Translation. He's got good sources on LeBron. But let's not talk Chris Sherritt and let's talk LeBron. Did you notice that LeBron did not tweet yesterday that Chris Sheraton was wrong? And LeBron was all over. I checked on Twitter yesterday. Foundation, charity, wife, friends, hoops. No denial. Well, Colin, I mean, come on. He was busy. LeBron immediately denied the Stephen A. Smith story that LeBron wanted to kick Kyrie... Irving's butt, immediate denial. Remember when that story came out? LeBron eager to trade Kyrie. Immediate denial. Remember when the former general manager, David Griffin, was being let go? Immediate tweet in support of David Griffin. When David Blatt was fired, an immediate, I had nothing to do with it. Chris Sheraton, he's gone. It's over. Crickets. There's a follow-up tweet by Chris Sheraton, NBA reporter. 
One follow-up tweet on LeBron leaving. Denials from his reps are disingenuous. They will slash must lie to protect his image. Look up the word disingenuous. Hypocrites. Translation. He got it from people close to LeBron. What have I said about LeBron? He is in stage three of his career, i.e. the mogul stage, where brand protection now trumps winning basketball games. Brand protection for Spielberg, Jay-Z, Michael Jordan, LeBron, Kobe, when they get to stage three of stardom. Uh, First, it's look at me. Second, it's platinum records. Third, it's the mogul stage. What are you saying, Colin? By LeBron not denying it in the first 24 hours, he is softening the blow for when, not if, he leaves. Don't you think it's interesting, too, that when LeBron left Cleveland initially, it never got out. When LeBron left Miami before the letter, it never got out. Yet a year ahead of time, this is getting out. It's getting out because somebody is okay with it being out. Okay, I want to shift gears to Mayweather McGregor. Kevin Ioli covers boxing and now UFC. He's a very good writer. We bring him on this show. Column in his newspaper, why the Nevada Athletic Commission was wrong to approve lighter gloves. Yes, they did. Instead of 10-ounce, they're using 8-ounce gloves. Kevin Ioli writes, a very legitimate reporter, the Nevada Athletic Commission might as well be a for-profit business and not a state regulatory body, given the message it sent yesterday when it approved a request for Floyd and Connor to wear smaller gloves. You know he's right. He also said the commission often pays lip service to its duty to protect the health and safety of the fighters. You know he's right. He continues, the regulations were put in place for a reason, and this ruling simply creates liability should a tragedy occur. Once again, Kevin Ioli is right. And he finishes by saying the commission was going to do whatever it took to get this bout done. That's the bottom line. And he's right again. Yet I am not bothered by any of it. Boxing began with no gloves and unlimited rounds. Then they shifted to gloves. And limited rounds. Was a study ever done to change those moves? Nope. By the way, 10-ounce gloves are used at 154 pounds in boxing in Nevada. At 147, you can use 8-ounce gloves. Was a study done on that? No. My point is boxing has been making it up on their own forever. Can you imagine NASCAR saying the speed limit is now at 184 miles an hour? 188. You're in peril. 184, it is smooth sailing. You can drive to the grocery store at that speed. That's what this sounds like to me. The gloves now are the issue. Now think about this. The gloves now are the issue. The Nevada Athletic Commission okay to fight between the world's best pound-for-pound fighter and a man who's never boxed. And I'm worried about something the weight of a slice of bread. This is calling up the Nevada Athletic Commission and saying, I just saw a bunch of mob guys take out baseball bats and whack people over the head, may have killed them, and drive off. And the Nevada Athletic Commission saying, you know, That's fine, but what really bothers us is the mob guys weren't wearing seatbelts. They sanctioned this fight between the world's best fighter and a guy who hasn't boxed. Once you sanctioned this fight, it was a circus. And both adult participants signed off on the circus. And as I think about this fight... The odds right now are Floyd's like minus 500. That means you got to bet 500 on Floyd to win 100, right? And I'm thinking about this. 401ks, real estate, tech stocks. You can bet $1,000 on Floyd 
And 36 minutes later, win $200. You can bet $10,000 on Floyd. And 36 minutes later, have $2,000. I'm going to say something that may seem highly inappropriate. And irresponsible. I think the world's best investment is betting oh. on Floyd Mayweather. Oh, no, no, and, no, and no, It's no, not no. your 401k. It's not Merrill Lynch. It's not real estate. <laughs> Where in the world can you get $200 out of 1,000 in 36 minutes? That's an incredible opportunity. But imagine if something goes wrong. That's hey, going to saw... make, make that fight really yeah. hard to watch for yeah. people who are betting like $10,000 yeah. because they think it's a sure yeah, thing. Yeah, imagine if something goes wrong with my 401k. It did. It's called AIG. But it's not <laughs> It's not that fast. You, you didn't see my 401k shrink in two days. Yeah, I've seen, I'm an old guy. I've seen my 401k evaporate in an hour. What's the tax situation on a bet? When you, when you place a bet on Floyd. The, the rules are you don't pay taxes on anything in Vegas. That's always been my rule. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just tell everyone that when I'm there? No, I mean, if you, let, let's say this. Everybody listening to me, just, just, you just won $10 million in the lottery. You could bet a million and get 200000 back in 36 minutes. I don't work for Merrill Lynch. I would suggest you should do it right now. That is, I've seen my 401k shrink. I've seen my SEP IRA dwindle. I, 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 you know what? I'm betting on this fight. Now, I, again, I, all seriousness, you just don't do that. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to even tell my wife. Well, I think I'm betting everything be shy of right my now. mortgage. Colin, do you know how many guys out there are listening to you right now and they're taking all of their hard-earned oh, money? Oh, please. And now they're going to place bets. Not a guy in the world believes anything I say. This this show is, honestly, it's a, it's it's make-believe. Every day it just disappears into the ether. Well, that's and, good to know. <laughs> or like Mickey Mouse. Here's the thing. Or not. Here's the thing. If I bet my daughter's tuition, it is possible... She'll have to go to trucking school. But the upside is I can afford Princeton in 36 minutes. I'm willing to take that chance with my daughter's career. Listen, trucking school. You can work. There are You drive on a road in Texas. See the whole country. There's, there's a million trucking truck stops. But she then you a also flexible have to schedule. go to a truck stop. You know have what? you seen a truck stop? I have delicious sandwiches. Have you seen what happens at truck stops? I have commerce. Yeah, commerce. <laughs> I just, it's just, it just came to me. You can make a lot of money quickly betting on Floyd. I, I'm just, I'm just. I'm not betting even a penny. All right. Well, mm -hmm. one of us is showing up on Monday in a Bentley and one of us is driving a Kia. Just Kias remember that. great. <laughs> Blake Griffin drives one. Yeah, sure he does. We've been making news this week on the show. It's almost like we're journalists. Floyd Sr., last hour on the show. I think he made news. I asked him about Floyd Jr.'s training heading into this fight, and here's what he said. His training is good. Good, not great. I'm saying it's good enough. Okay, so it's, are you admitting it's not the most intense training? I can say a many times many time before it was better, but I'm saying here now, He's training good enough for a guy like this. He is acknowledging it's not Floyd's best camp. This is the shot I give Connor. Go look at Muhammad Ali's career. Michael Spinks, first time he fought him. A Chuck Wepner. When you're the greatest in the world, Michael Jordan, 72 and 10 Bulls, lost to the Raptors. It's not the big games or the big fights or the big meetings or the big dates. Stars get up for those. It's apathy. It's, I got this one before we fight. That's Connor's edge. Other story today, Chris Sheridan, who, by the way, now is out of the media business, but had this story fall into his lap. Chris Sheridan tweets with 100% conviction. Uh, we have gotten in contact with Chris. He says he stands by it. That NBA sources said today this will be LeBron's final season in Cleveland, 100% leaving relationship with owners beyond repair. Um, I I think this 
is absolutely not only newsworthy, but I, I think reporters have a right to make mistakes. Chris isn't perfect. No reporter is. But I know Chris works hard when he was a full-time reporter. Um, he was accurate often and willing to go out there with stories uh, that others would not and often first on stories. So I don't know Chris. I've interviewed him once. I do not know him personally. I've never met him. I don't even think I've I've seen him at an event. I wouldn't know if I I wouldn't know what he looks like. Uh, but uh, I, over time, there are people whose opinions and sources I trust. Um, and Chris Sheraton has been accurate more than he's been inaccurate, significantly more. Um, I, you know, I think the story that has always been really interesting to me because I do think LeBron's leaving has always been why Kyrie wants out of Cleveland. And I thought. Two hours ago, Chris Broussard was on this show, and I don't know how long we edited this. I hope we allow him to tell the whole story, but um, there's a real backstory to this Kyrie thing, and it makes sense. I'm told that the Cavaliers had a deal done heading into the draft. Cleveland would send Kyrie to Phoenix, which does want Kyrie. Robert Sarver wants Kyrie Irving. They would send him to Phoenix. Phoenix would send Eric Bledsoe in the number four pick back to the Cavaliers. The Cavaliers would send the number four pick to Indiana for Paul George. Dan Gilbert goes to LeBron and says, look, we got this deal on the table. I'll do it if you'll commit long term to stay in Cleveland. LeBron won't commit. Kyrie Irving finds out about the deal, whether it was from David Griffin telling him after he left or however he found out, but he found out about the deal and he assume there is and he rightly assumed there's no way the Cavaliers are doing this if unless LeBron gives consent that's why he got mad with LeBron he thought LeBron was in on it LeBron denies he was in on it it was brought to LeBron and he went that's a hell of a trade (laughs) if Kyrie's unhappy that's a hell of a trade so you've got communication miscommunication um, I, I, Christine talked about this earlier. I think the interesting one is it is a point guard league now, much more than a center big league. I mean, centers sometimes they take him out late of games. I mean, Carl Anthony Towns, unbelievable player. He doesn't handle the ball as much. I think he's a better player than Wiggins. Wiggins can handle the ball more. We live in a world now in the NBA where because of the regulations and rules, you can't, you can't hand check. So like point guards can get to the basket anytime they want. They're, virtually you cannot defend a point guard anymore. You just can't defend them. You can't touch them like you could do years ago. Um, and, and where is now the three-point shot? If you can master that, John Wall hasn't. Kyrie Irving has. Uh, uh, Russell Westbrook hasn't. Steph Curry has. If you can master the three, basically as a point guard now, you cannot defend people. They can get past you. You can't hand check them. They can shoot a three now. That brings you out. You can't hand check it. It's so easy for the great point guards now to score. It is a point guard league. Just like in the NFL now with no huddle, 55 snaps to 68, 72 snaps. It has never been more of a quarterback's game than touch the ball 15 times more a game. And so I think Kyrie is more valuable than Porzingis. And if I was the Knicks, though, Kyrie handling the ball way more than Porzingis, I think would be a smash hit in New York City. But if I'm Cleveland, I think Kyrie's better than Porzingis. But I got to be honest, Porzingis younger? LeBron would elevate him, and I think it's about as good as we can get. If I'm Cleveland, I make that move. And I got to be honest, if I'm New York, I think I make that move. Kyrie's better, but it works for the Knicks. He is a quarter. They haven't had a quarterback in. Look at the Knicks point guards in the last 20 years. They've had decent wing players. They have a decent big. They haven't had their quarterback in 20 years. They haven't had a quarterback in 20 years. The Knicks could get that. Roll the dice on if he stays. I think he would. I think it's potentially in New York. They surround him with stuff. But if I'm if I'm the Cavs, I'm like, listen, pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered. Porzingis is really good. Take Porzingis' numbers, add 10% because he's better, add another 10% because he's LeBron. Take his numbers right now and add 20% to Porzingis next year with LeBron. 10% on he's just going to improve. I mean, Wiggins gets better. Carl Anthony Towns gets better incrementally. And add 10% because LeBron just makes everybody better. As good as Porzingis is, Eastern Conference, he is an absolute first-team all-star for the next six, seven years with LeBron James. Christine with the news. No, 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 no. Turn on the news. This is the Herdline News. 
The Raptors GM Bobby Webster admits that the Raptors called the Cavs about Kyrie Irving. But honestly, that doesn't surprise me. I think every GM should be calling about Kyrie Irving just to see what they're looking at, what they want in exchange. Sure. Uh, I think it's the responsible thing to do. Mm-hmm. I'm just very excited to see where he lands. Yeah. Uh, how often do you get pedicures? I don't. Why not? I think it's pretty obvious. I am um, the closest thing to a lumberjack on American radio. See, I think it takes a strong man to be willing to go get a pedicure, and it's the best thing ever. Every guy I've ever taken to get a pedicure with me, it was the same way before we went. Like, I'm a man. I don't need a pedicure. Yeah. And then I took him. He's like, this is the best thing I, ever. I think it takes a stronger man to cut wood with an axe like I do. Anyway, Or continue. a woman to probably cut your toenails because they're so thick. What's the story? My point is, is that USA Today Sports just did a little show kind of thing and found out that 90% of NBA players regularly get pedicures. I'm a part of that 90%. I get pedicures and manicures. <laughs> I'm definitely one of those. I am part of that. I do get pedicures. I don't get it a lot, but I do get it. <laughs> no, I'm the 10% that don't. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that guy? And I bet if you but I, to- I think I'm a star. There you go. <laughs> you know, sitting there, you know, it actually felt good. Uh, it treats you nice, and, um, you know, they kind of give you a little foot massage at the end. So I'm all for it. There is nothing worse than seeing a guy's feet and that it's all gross and his nails are disgusting. Plus, if you're a basketball player, you, like, need the calluses taken care of. That, that part. your toenails situated. Especially, like, uh, if you're a runner, like, people who are marathoners, yeah. like, your feet get nasty. Yes, I appreciate a guy Cyclist. that is finally manicured. Let me tell you something. The one massage that is way underrated. I'm going to tell you right now. Don't look at me like that. I, I have no, what, <laughs> what, what kind of massage are you Why are you looking at me about? like that? Go ahead. Scalp massage? Oh, my God. Yes. Oh, my heavens. Oh, it's the world's. There's nothing like. In fact, you know what? You know how I said earlier, betting Floyd Mayweather is the smartest financial move you could make? You know what I'm going to open up? A chain of scalp massage places. Seriously, today I'm changing my life. It just sounds like lice to me. Mm, Sounds like life to me. If you only give scalp massages. Oh, my God. Have you ever had one? Yeah, of course. Oh, I'm like a cat. (sighs) Oh, God, they're the best. That's probably when they stop massaging your scalp. Goulet, you got more head on your chin, hair on your chin than your head. Have you ever done a scalp massage? I have never done oh any my God. kind of massage. It's just, you can't you, even... Whoa, time out. You've never had a massage, period? Like a professional one, no. Well, excuse me. I ain't made other money. Kinds of massages. I don't get paid enough for stuff one? like that. Wait, seriously? You've never had a massage? Nope. Have you, know, you two eat? Of course. Do you know what? I, I massage my... You? I massage my wife's feet. No, you don't. Yes, I do. How often? About seven years ago. I'm going to have to call you Rex. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, uh, Guy Fieri, if you watch the Food Network, yeah. he's very big there, yeah. uh, especially for his like tailgate-type food and barbecue. So he was doing something with Marshawn Lynch, and mm-hmm. here he is explaining what he's doing. What's up, Raider Nation? Guy Fieri here at training camp in Napa cooking up a bunch of chickens on the Huli Huli wood-fired oven for the guys. Going to be a great year. So he's making some rotisserie chicken and watch him explaining to Marshawn Lynch. And watch Lynch's reaction. He's very, very excited. He is. About the rotisserie chicken. I like that Diners Drivers Dash show. Oh, they, you actually watch that? Yeah, they give you like die. They'll find a b- bar in Nashville. Diners, like, drive-ins, and dives. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Dash. I want to be on that show because you never eat what I bring in and cook, but I think I can make. You probably... don't. You don't. You bring in a massive chocolate cake from Safeway. It, excuse me. Yeah, you brought in a cake. It sat there no, for six. No, it was six... from Portillo's. That's different. It's the best chocolate cake that exists in the entire world. Yeah, but no, I'm talking about the cookies that I bring in. Yeah, the you cupcakes never. Cupcakes that I make. Christine, you. You bring in literally trays of corn syrup, which was trying to no, mix no, in some no kale. No, there's no corn syrup in there. There's sugar, and it's in, really good, and everyone loves them, and I can make amazing tailgate food, so I should probably be on this show. All right. Christine, nice. the news. Well, that's the news. And thanks for stopping by. The Herd Live. I said news. earlier he'd won multiple Super Bowls, just one, but that's still pretty amazing. His name is Seth Joyner, Eagles, Cards, Packers, Broncos. Okay. Let me, let me throw this theory at you. I'm going to throw a theory at you. 
is that, uh, and again, th- th- this I don't feel this is political. I just feel this is an observation that they used to call him no drama Obama. For eight years, we didn't have a lot of drama. We didn't have leaks. We didn't have, I mean, really, the White House had, <laughs> here's our staff. Rahm Emanuel left early, but it was, with Trump, there's more drama. Right. And people that were apolitical in my life, in my life, Seth, now are political, is that a lot of these protests are Trump-driven, that players, African Americans feel like, hey, man, I got to speak out on this stuff, that a lot of these guys aren't even political animals. They're like dudes, right? Like, you tell me. Um, were you as you're a little political? Were you as political six years ago? I I've always been a thinker. Um, I've always been a studier of things that are that are going on around me, mm-hmm. and very aware of you know my situation. I think you know what Trump has done is he's sparked um, you know some things inwardly in people, emotions, strong it, emotions yeah, that 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 makes them have to speak out. Anger. Because I think that, you know, over time, you know, things have gotten better in the United States. Mm -hmm. And in the environment that we're now witnessing, it seems like there are those that want to pull us back. It's it's disheartening to a lot of people. Absolutely. You know, and for what was sacrificed, the lives that were sacrificed, um, there's just no way that, you know, we can stand by and allow that to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would call it to some degree the Trump effect. Probably. I mean, I, listen, look, Seth, one year ago, you didn't have it. You mm-hmm. do now. I mean, it just seems like to me, stuff doesn't appear out of thin air, right? Right. And I'm not, I'm not trying to take sides. I mean, Charlottesville was disgusting, and it was vile and repugnant. Um, and by the way, that kind of situation has happened every decade the last five, six decades. Right. But there is a sense, as you say, that things are now reverting to a place many are uncomfortable. Tell me about your social circle. Is politics discussed more among your professional athlete friends? Um, I can't speak for everybody else. You know, I, I just know myself that nothing's off the table with me when it comes to discussion. Okay. You know, if you want to talk politics, if you want to talk religion, if you want to talk sex, whatever it is you want to talk, I'm open for it. Because as far as I'm concerned, I see I, I see a lot of people calling it, say, you know, especially on my Twitter, you know, you're a football player, stick to football. <laughs> I would say, you know, don't question my intellect in the least little bit because you have no idea what, you know, my education level is. You have no idea of my commitment to um, gathering knowledge and understanding and then applying that through wisdom. Um, So if I watch Don Lemon or if I watch um, um, Wolf Blitzer, if I watch any of those guys on TV, what have they done? They've got the information, and their network has either allowed them to express their own opinion or given them an opinion to drive the conversation, okay? So what is the difference between those gentlemen and myself? Well, also, here's the other thing, that – Politics is now, whether you like it or I like it, has entered sports. I mean, once Kaepernick took a knee, he's an NFL quarterback. He made a statement. Well, I've got to talk about that situation. Politics has always been in sports. For the last three decades, it's just laid dormant. Okay? Mm-hmm. Oh, Muhammad, Muhammad Ali. Ali. Cool. The, the, the list goes on and on and sure. on. But at the end of the day, it's always been there. But the minute that racism... Anti-Semitics, um, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, the minute that they start to rear their ugly heads, then we have to confront it. Yeah. We have to confront it. And, 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 and it's, it's spilling over into to athletics, into sports, because these athletes have a, have a platform to speak from, to draw attention to it. Yes. And to make those people who endorse it makes them feel uncomfortable. And that's the only way that you affect change is by making those people feel uncomfortable. Well said, Seth Joyner. You know, you know what I always say to people? And I, and I, I, am, uh, I have made a, a choice in a very fragmented industry um, that I'm not doing a lot of politics, although I talked about Kaepernick today, um, and I talked about the anthems. I think there are certain things that need to be addressed. I'm not going to hide from them, but not gonna, I'm not going to seek them out. If they seek me, I'll talk about them. Right. When anybody ever says stick to sports... I go and I look what they do for a living, and I'm, I'm like, wait a minute. 
you're in insurance and you're lecturing me on the radio <laughs> business. Why don't you stick to insurance? You know, when anybody tells you stick to, oh, but you're lecturing me on my industry. Shouldn't you stick to insurance, car sales, landscaping, whatever you're in? Seth Joyner joining us. I said this earlier, and you can disagree on this, but I think I compared Jay Cutler to Nicolas Cage. Enigmatic, moody, not my favorite. I, I would tell, I've told Jay Cutler that. I, I think his body language stinks. But Jay Cutler and Nicolas Cage, if you had three weeks and a movie star went down, <laughs> you would go, okay, t- we have Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise just broke his legs. You put Nick Cage there, and people are like, he's not as good as, but it is a movie star. Right. Now, Christopher Walken, I compare to Kaepernick. By the way, Kaepernick got to a Super Bowl. Christopher Walken won an Oscar. I would argue Kaepernick, physically more talented than Cutler. Christopher Walken, better actor than Nick Cage. But Kaepernick feels like, to me, came into this league as a backup, lost his job to Gabbert. He's a backup. So I said, to me, Cutler, when Tannehill goes down, Seth, bringing Cutler in feels like the players and coaches. He is a franchise guy, a totally flawed Kaepernick doesn't feel like that. And I think you could lose the locker room if you chose Cap. Well, I I, I honestly believe that the only sense that Jay Cutler makes in this situation Mm -hmm. above Kaepernick or Mm -hmm. anyone else is the familiarity between him and Adam Gase. All right. That's the only thing. The rest of it, throw it away. Now, in defense of Kaepernick, I would say when you look at quarterbacks that come out of spread offenses in college, at Colin Kaepernick, a Cam Newton, and they're making a change in how Cam is going to play the game of football this mm-hmm. year. Um, RG3, um, the kid down in um, Bortles, down in Jacksonville. Yeah, that's about okay? to end. Yeah. Those players came into the league, and these teams formulated an offense okay, to, um, to suit their skill set instead of developing them as NFL prototypical quarterbacks. So you think you shouldn't play to your strengths, develop a pocket game. You can play to your strengths. I think the strengths are an asset when things break down. But the NFL game and the college game is different. Of course, yeah. You can run the ball and play action and run the ball so effectively like Tim Tebow did throughout his high school and college career that when you go play action pass, you've got – Three guys downfield that you can choose from. The NFL game is a is a rhythm and timing passing game. Three step drop, ball's got to be gone. Five step drop, the ball's got to be gone. Seven step drop, the ball has to be gone on time. And until you begin to take these quarterbacks who played in these spread offenses and bring them in and raise them up as quarterbacks that are NFL ready to play the game at this level, then you're going to continue to see these guys struggle. Now, don't tell me that these guys can't be transformed because they can. It's just easier to put them in a spread offense and go read option and let them do what they've been familiar with. Well, couldn't I make the argument to your point, Seth? Everybody has to change. Tom's a pocket guy. He's evolved every year in this league. Tom, four years ago, had a quote. He said, I'm hurting my team. I've lost my mobility. The next year, Tom slid in the pocket better. So, by the way, pilots, the the flight you're on flying home, he has to go to training every year. Right. We're all in training. Absolutely. So why not train the quarterbacks better? Because it's easier to just give them what they're familiar with than to go through the pain of having to having to develop them. It's a lot of work. And, and then and then when you look at the time restrictions that that are now within the CBA, like when I came up as a after my rookie season, Buddy Ryan looked at me and said, you know, what's your plan for the off season? Well, I think I'm going to go back to El Paso. I'm going to roll in school. He said, like, the, the off-season program starts on February 28th. You're either going to be a student or you're going to be a football player. So, so I knew, <laughs> I basically knew where I was going to be come February 28th. And we were in training from February 28th until the coaches went on vacation in June. Every single day, five days a week, lifting, studying film, out on the field, going through stuff. I mean, I could just, I can remember the conversation I had with Wade Phillips. He was my linebacker coach at the time. And how many times are we going to have to do this, 3Z? He's like, you're going to do it until it becomes as natural to you as walking is. Do you think about walking? No, you just do it. That's why we're here. Well, now you don't have that time 
to work with players in the offseason the way you used to. So now you've got to speed up their development. You know, and I think that that plays into – I get the CBA and I understand why they did it, but I think the young players are suffering and the developmental stages of the game for players today are suffering because they don't have the time in the offseason, post-rookie season – to come in and work on their craft and master their craft. They thought they won in the CBA, practicing less. It actually hurts players, Big especially time. the aspirational ones. I love when you come to our network, Seth Joyner. He'll be on Speak for Yourself later. Always thoughtful. Good seeing you, bud. Welcome back. Kurt brought to you by J.C. Penny. Guys, get there now. Levi's lowest price of the year. 514 straight fit under 40 bucks. 511 slim fit under $42. Not going to last long. Get your pennies worth, J.C. Penny. Uh, news made on the show today. Floyd Mayweather Sr. acknowledged that Floyd Mayweather is not training like Floyd Mayweather has for his biggest fights. Here's Floyd Mayweather Sr. about an hour ago in the herd. His training is good. Good, not great. I'm saying it's good enough. Okay, so it's... Are you admitting it's not the most intense training? I can say it many times many time before it was better, but I'm saying here now he's training good enough for a guy like this. Being honest, I, I got to appreciate the honesty. Uh, I think the opening for Connor here is in that statement, that Floyd sees this as virtually an unskilled sparring partner and we're all human, man. You can't convince yourself. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. Let's say I just I, I, I retired in ten years, like in and and I was offered a job doing weekend sports in Sacramento. I just wouldn't work as hard because I wouldn't have to. When you when you when you when you have a bigger audience, you work harder. That's nothing against Sacramento. If if Iowa football said we want you to do sidelines, first of all, I'd say no, thank you. But um, it'd be very boring. Um, oh, but, I think that would be quite entertaining, actually. Yeah, I'll, yeah. Schedule somebody I've heard of, and I'll be your sideline oh, reporter geez. and announce on the air. Oh, we're down forty-nine, nothing here. Reporting live from the Iowa sidelines of of weeping players. It's Colin Cowherd reporting. I would love to. The see point that. being is, you can't convince people urgency if stuff's not urgent. You just can't. There's not a single man or woman listening to me that if they're highly skilled in any profession and they've got an easy day or an easy job that, that, that you can on a consistent level bring your best. It's just harder. It just is. I mean, if I won Powerball tomorrow, it, it'd be hard to drive to work with the same urgency and uh, intensity that I have today. You know, if you won $300 million, I think we're all like that, right? Uh, the other story is LeBron James. Um, uh, he is uh, his camp is not denying the Chris Sheridan report that he is 100 percent leaving Cleveland. They're not denying it. And they've denied everything that they believe to be untrue. And they're not denying it. I think he's laying the groundwork for LeBronzo. I do think LeBron will leave Cleveland and he will not go to an unglamorous market. He will not go to Memphis or Orlando. I think he would go to a team he believes have a chance to win. And I think Brandon Ingram and Lonzo, as they emerge this year, won a second-year player, won a rookie as star-level potential players. I think in one year that's going to be very attractive. With Luke Walton, with this roster that has been built to score from the perimeter, and if Paul George could be convinced with LeBron to go to join Lonzo and Paul George... I think LeBronzo would happen. I, I will tell you this. Can I just say this about LeBron James? He has the best Twitter account in the world. He uses these emojis, and I don't know where in the world he gets all these emojis. Non-facts people, boo, get another source. Enjoying my summer. You do the same. The guy has the best emojis, and I asked the staff today, where do you get them? I am going to create emojis. You love emojis. I love them. You yeah. know I love them. So when people say to me, Westbrook is the MVP because people always want to tell me Westbrook's the MVP. From now on, I'm going to use this emoji. Mm, talk to the hand. Kind of looks like you. If 
you tell me Iowa deserves to play for the national championship or be in the playoff, I'm going to use from this point forward this emoji. Don't pass go. And if you tell me Andrew Luck is overrated, and that happens like 15 times a day, I'm going to use this emoji from this point forward. We just made that one up. So I love emojis. You know why? Here's the thing. I don't leave messages. I don't like talking on the phone. And texting can be long and tedious. If I can just send a symbol, isn't that the best? Just like a symbol. I didn't even have to create the symbol. I just go like, symbol. Yeah. Love it. Very excited about that. So I am off tomorrow. I probably shouldn't advertise that. (laughs) But uh, I'm going to take tomorrow off. It is August. It's in the summer. I'm going to watch Jay Cutler debut for the Miami Dolphins tonight. Um, which I'm actually, um, again, I, I, I think he's about 90% of Tannehill. Uh, he doesn't run like Tannehill, but with Adam Gase, I think Jay Cutler is going to be okay. You know, Jay Cutler is similar to Floyd Mayweather. Does Jay Cutler care? F- no, Ryan Tannehill really cared. Like, Ryan Tannehill was getting better with Jay Cutler. Is Jay Cutler, is he all in on this? I don't know. Um, my guess is he's probably as in as Jay Cutler generally is I do think Jay Cutler with Adam Gase makes them the second best team in that division and I do believe they'll be playoff viable I think they're going to be like Houston you know I think Houston will be playoff viable not sure they're going to make it game's not on television that game on tele you can find it there's a different one it. it's on tv somewhere it's on tv so I'm, you know what tonight's one you of those nights Christine's like, illegal feeds yeah I'm going to take one of Christine's illegal feeds. Go to theherdnow.com. Free stuff, theherdnow.com. It's the herd.